Welcome, welcome, welcome to Past Psych Tonight. I'm your host, renowned Professor Ross, or as I'm known around here, the severed parasitic Sklar brother who somehow miraculously survived. Our main story tonight concerns the brain. And some of you might be wondering, what does the brain have to do with psychology? Well, that'd be like going into an auto shop and stopping them when they tell you about the engine. Whoa, 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 grease monkey. What the hell does the engine have to do with my car? Our brain is the crowning glory of the central nervous system, and unraveling how it works is key to understanding human behavior. It's also important to note that we use all of our brain. Yes, all of our brain, not just 10%. So sorry, Lucy and Limitless and Tommy Boy and Flight of the Navigator and The Simpsons and Scott Pilgrim vs. The World, all right? Can we stop already with this myth? There's no magic pill to access different regions of your brain. But there is a magic pill to improve digestive health and diversify your gut bacteria. VSL3, when you think number one for helping you with number two, think number three. <laughs> Moving on. There are three major regions of the brain, each consisting of different parts. These three regions are the hindbrain, the midbrain, and the forebrain. Let us begin by discussing your hindbrain. The hindbrain is located at the lower back part of the brain and consists of the cerebellum, medulla, or medulla oblongata, and pons. The cerebellum, also called the little brain because it resembles a small brain, though I think it could be called regurgitated cauliflower or head scrotum, <laughs> is responsible for fine-tuning our movements to make them more accurate, and it helps control our balance. So just to be clear, the commands for movement come elsewhere, but our cerebellum modifies the commands to help us look more graceful. So what might happen if the cerebellum were not completely developed? Well, look to Wobbly Cats for the answer. Now, as you can see from the video, these kittens have an underdeveloped cerebellum, and they appear to be struggling to walk home after a wild night of ripping one too many fat lines of catnip off the living room floor. Next is our medulla, which has the appearance of an overstuffed Jimmy Dean's breakfast sausage link. Your medulla plays a role in controlling vital autonomic functions like breathing, heart rate, blood pressure, and reflexes like swallowing, vomiting, and coughing. And now, for what many of you are thinking of. After all, it is medulla oblongata. <laughs> So, what would happen if something was wrong with your medulla oblongata? Well, damage can have serious consequences like difficulty breathing and even death. On to the pons, seen here resembling the poorly shaped butt of someone who only did squats with one leg for three years. Your pons is considered a bridge connecting the hindbrain to the rest of the brain and is a complex collection of various tracts and nuclei that handle several important functions, like regulating your sleep-wake cycle or fine-tuning and adjusting breathing patterns. Now, many theorize that REM sleep originates here, and the pawns may play a role in generating dreams and preventing us from acting them out while we sleep. Some individuals, like my favorite comedian, Mike Birbiglia, I urge you to check him out. They suffer from REM sleep behavior disorder, in which dysfunction in the pons causes them to act out their dreams during their sleep. I jumped in my sleep through a second story window of a La Quinta Inn. <laughs> yeah, when I say through, I mean through the glass. The glass was double paned. I ended up with 33 stitches in my legs. The glass was a centimeter from my femoral artery. Had it struck there, 
I could have just bled out on the front lawn and died. I was diagnosed with a very rare thing. It's called REM behavior disorder. So when I go to bed at night, I take medication and I sleep in a sleeping bag <laughs> up to my neck, and I wear mittens. <laughs> so I can't open the sleeping bag. And that's my life. Speaking of dreams, you know, I recently had a dream that I was late for school and I had a really big test. But when I got to class, the teacher was my dad. And he made me recite all the times that I disappointed him in sports growing up. Huh. That, that probably doesn't have any deeper meaning though, right? Anyways. Yeah. All right, next up is the midbrain. And let me tell you, Gen Z viewers, the midbrain is anything but mid, fam. No cap. Gang, gang. The midbrain consists of structures located deep within the brain, between the forebrain and the hindbrain. The reticular formation is centered in the midbrain, but it actually extends into the forebrain and down in the hindbrain. Your reticular formation is involved in stereotypical patterns of behavior like you're walking, you're sleeping, or turning to attend to noise. Also located within our midbrain is the substantia nigra and the ventral tegmental area, also abbreviated VTA. These regions contain large numbers of dopamine producing neurons. And dopamine, well dopamine is everyone's favorite neurotransmitter because it's involved in reward experiences and pleasure. So lots of activity here when you see your favorite band and they play a ton of bangers. Or when you see this adorable pig eating ice cream. For me, this area goes into overdrive whenever I watch a Michael Keaton film or I see his casual charm and comedic nimble-mindedness in talk show interviews. If I may, let me just take a minute to celebrate Michael Keaton. This man, he's a treasure and all-time talent. Actor, director, comedian, and friggin' Batman. Yeah. I'm Batman. In fact, I have a photo of my special K in my stairwell just so he's the first face that I see each morning. Moving on. The forebrain is by far the largest area of the brain and includes our entire cerebrum and important structures directly nestled within it. So let's start with these structures within. First up is our thalamus, which resembles a squished up eggplant that was trampled over by an out of control Jersey bull. The thalamus, <laughs> is the sensory relay station for the brain. Our thalamus can best be thought of as a traffic controller for our senses. All our sensory input, except for smell, arrives at the thalamus, and then the thalamus sends it to the appropriate center for interpretation in the cerebrum. So as you're hearing the dulcet tones of this lecture, these sounds are sent from the thalamus to the auditory cortex for processing. Or as you're taking in the sight of my disheveled hair, and my poorly tied tie, the visual input is routed from the thalamus to the visual cortex of your cerebrum. But smell, it's a little bit different because smell skips the thalamus. So next time you're ordering those industrial recycled steam pressed wheat, wet, wet beef scraps at Arby's and you detect a smell similar to what you'd imagine an all raccoon eyes wide shut party smells like, these noxious particles bypass your thalamus, and they head straight to our olfactory cortex in the temporal lobe. Arby's, we have the meat. No, Arby's, no. Okay, you have what is technically meat under only the most hateful interpretation of the law. Our focus now turns to the hypothalamus, which has a roundish shape and hole in the middle, kind of like a wonky donut and it functions as an interface between the nervous system and endocrine system and is involved in the production of the body's essential hormones. Due to this, the hypothalamus governs thirst, hunger, sleep, and our sex drive. Or as the cheeky author Wayne Wheaton describes it, the hypothalamus regulates the four Fs, feeding, fleeing, fighting, and mating. 
Am I the only one who sees this error? This isn't a fourth F at all, Wayne. You idiot. You mouth-breathing rube. Are we clear on what this fourth F is supposed to be? We're all clear on that, right? And what? It's f***ing. So we're clear. He means to say f***ing. And what might happen if a piece was destroyed? Well, one study destroyed the section of a rat brain that functions as a hunger off switch. And the rats had a boundless appetite, voraciously eating in a manner similar to Professor Roth when he's doing straight damage at that local Ponderosa buffet bar. Or like this little guy when he's feasting on a banana chip. And if you're thinking, well, Professor Ross, this must be the only awful bit of research done with rats, right? Well, think again, my friend. In fact, I encourage you to search a journal database for rat meth, rat obesity, how to kill lab rats, robo rats, or finally, small pants and rat sex. That's right. One researcher dressed rats in these tiny little underpants and he tracked their sexual behavior for a year as part of his lifelong quest to prove that polyester pants are not proper nookie attire. That, that's a real study. In fact, we've done rats so dirty that there's a monument in Russia recognizing the knowledge that we've gained at the expense of millions of rat lives. And here it is. All right, now let's turn our attention to the hippocampus, resembling what I'd imagine the love child of John Cena and a Pokemon horsey might look like. Your hippocampus plays an important role in the formation and retrieval of memories. So think memory when you think hippocampus. Now, while it's not believed to store memories, the hippocampus seems to determine what information should be printed into a durable, lasting trace in our brain. It might be best to view the hippocampus as sort of the nerdy librarian of the brain, organizing information so it can be easily accessed later. Now, what might happen if we were to have damage here? Well, Clive Waring is an individual who contracted a virus that severely impacted his hippocampus, leading to one of the worst cases of amnesia ever recorded. Clive lives his life in 30 second chunks as he's unable to form new memories. Now, the second Adam Sandler reference of this lecture. <laughs> For those of you 51st Date fans who remember 10 Second Tom. Hi, I'm Tom. Henry. Marlon. Doug. Lucy. Hi. Oh, those are cool flip-flops. Where'd you get them? You like those? It's an interesting story. I was over in the North Door the other day. And Hi, I'm I... Tom. Huh? Uh, Henry. Hi. Marlon. Tom lost part of his brain in a hunting accident. His memory only lasts 10 seconds. It was in an accident? That's terrible. Don't worry, you'll totally get over it in about three seconds. Get over it? I mean, what happened? Did I get shot in the brain? I... Hi, I'm Tom. We might describe this man as 30-second Clive. All right, let's continue with the amygdala, which has the appearance of a tiny almond that gobbled fistfuls of HGH and got totally yoked, and is considered the emotional center of the brain. The amygdala can function as the brain's emotional alarm system to alert us to threatening objects and thus is deeply connected to the emotion of fear. The amygdala also stamps our memory with emotions and helps us process and respond to emotional cues. For example, it assists you right now with interpreting the emotions on my face in these photos. When I learned McRib season had ended, when I saw people in love for the first time, or when I was politely asked to wear both underwear and pants at an olive garden. Finally, we will now tackle the cerebrum, which looks like a super wrinkly mushroom cap. The cerebrum is the largest part of our brain and considered the master control center coordinating all of our thoughts, actions, and perceptions. It's best that we break down the cerebrum by discussing its division. First, the cerebrum is divided into two halves, the left hemisphere and right hemisphere, or the left brain and right brain, as many refer to them. These halves are connected by a bundle of nerves called the corpus callosum, which allow them to communicate with one another. 
Research has shown that language processing seems to be primarily located in the left hemisphere, while the right seems to play a larger role in handling things like your spatial ability or musical skills. However, this does not mean that you are left or right brain. You are not left or right brain. This is a popular but false view. It is a myth, right? The two sides work together. The pop psychology notion of a left brain and a right brain, it fails to capture the intimacy of these two hemispheres' relationship together. Now, when we go within these hemispheres, each of them can be divided into four lobes. Your frontal lobe, your parietal lobe, your temporal lobe, and your occipital lobe. So four lobes. Although brain functions rely on many different regions across the entire brain working together, each lobe carries out the bulk of most functions. Our frontal lobe contains the primary motor cortex, which is responsible for controlling voluntary movements. Right? There's a little section of the brain, a strip for each body part. So as I move my right hand so gracefully right now while doing this sweet karate chop, yeah, yeah, commands for this right hand are coming from the motor cortex strip of my left frontal lobe. Now this is because the brain is cross-wired with our body. The left hemisphere coordinates the right side of our body and the right hemisphere coordinates the left side. If that sounds stupid and confusing to you, why don't you take it up with God or Charles Darwin or something? The frontal lobe also contains our prefrontal cortex or prefrontal lobe, which is responsible for higher level functioning like decision making, planning, impulse control, and working with the amygdala to regulate our emotions. So, if you're being forced by someone to watch this video and you want to throw something at your screen right now because you're annoyed by it, the prefrontal cortex is the part of your brain that's helping control that impulse, stopping you like a brake. <laughs> Interestingly, the prefrontal cortex is one of the last areas of the brain to develop. And it's certainly not mature during teen years, so that might help explain some of the dumb things you did during your teen years, like eating Tide Pods for attention, <laughs> vaping Mountain Dew, or sending an erotic haiku to your 10th grade civics teacher, Mr. Mattis. While the exact timeline of development can vary, many believe our prefrontal cortex matures by around 25 or 26. So basically the message here is once you're thinking like an adult with a truly mature brain, Leonardo DiCaprio will not date you. He won't want you. Okay, perhaps we're being hard on him. Perhaps it's a misconception that Mr. DiCaprio is only interested in partnering with women under the age of 25, when in reality, our boy Leo, he might just be really turned on by immature prefrontal cortexes, which just so happens to coincide with women 25 and under. Really? It's possible? He'd likely be just as happy with an 85-year-old with a prefrontal lesion or with most American football players. <laughs> Lastly, the frontal lobe also contains Broca's area which is involved in the planning and coordination of muscles required for speech production. Broca's area helps convert our thoughts into coherent sentences. So, if you're loving this absolute symphony of perfectly pitched sounds right now, you can thank my Broca's area, baby. Now, damage to this area can result in something known as Broca's aphasia, which you may have heard of. Broca's aphasia is a condition where people have difficulty forming words and sentences. Here is former Congresswoman Gabby Giffords explaining what her experiences with aphasia is like. Gabby, what is it like to know what you want to say, but you're not able to find the words? No bueno. Aphasia really sucks. The words are there in my brain. I just can't get them out. Up next, the parietal lobe. Your parietal lobe plays a role in things like spatial location and attention shifting. But the main thing I want to talk about is the somatosensory cortex, which is housed here. This cortex processes touch, temperature, and pain. So as I touch this desk with my left hand, my right parietal lobe helps me register it as cheaply made and very, very wobbly. <laughs> and you may be wondering, okay, well, then why is pain also registered here? Well, pain is really just a type of touch, but someone has touched you too hard. <laughs> it's an odd way of phrasing it, but you know what? Make sure to use this expression the next time you're mad at somebody. 
Back off, Jack. I'm about to touch you really hard and you won't like it. All right, next up is your temporal lobe. The temporal lobe plays a key role in processing auditory information or sound. The temporal lobe houses Wernicke's area. Wernicke's area handles comprehension of language. The temporal lobe also houses the primary auditory cortex, which helps perceive and process sound. So, you hear that sound, your temporal lobe is involved in processing it. And it helps some of you thirsty folks out there recognize that's the sound of a Tinder match. Finally, the last lobe I want to talk about is your occipital lobe. The occipital lobe houses the primary visual cortex, and it's primarily responsible for receiving and processing visual information from your eyes. It's the first stop for analyzing and interpreting visual input to make sense of our world. Hopefully, it can help some of you make sense of this high school yearbook photo of mine. <laughs> I legitimately picked out my best outfit it was my choice, and I made sure to bring my bowling ball in as a prop. Watch out, world. Wait until you get a load of this tattered Cartman tee, tapered 80s jeans, and my Brunswick Blue Bomber. <sighs> and now, this. And now, a bunch of movies that wrongly assert we only use 10 to 20% of our brain. We discovered that your inferior species uses only 10% of your brain. You are actively dumber after viewing this clip! And you know how they say that we can only access 20% of our brain? You can learn more about the human brain by eating a book! Okay. You know how you only use 10% of your brain? We already use 100% of our brains, Nico! Let's say the average person uses 10% of their brain. Holy Nike! You better, Tommy boy! Well, the next stage would probably be control of other people. But for that, we would need to access at least 40% of our brain's capacity. We needed one more clip for pacing. And Steve hates himself and you. So here's Lucy. Seriously, this movie is a hate crime against science, writing, and God. I'd like to end our show by turning our attention to a competition called the Art of Neuroscience. This competition started in 2011 at the Netherlands Institute for Neuroscience, or NIN, N-I-N. My apologies to Nine Inch Nails, sorry, but this is the premier usage of that acronym, and anyone who disagrees with me can go forth at themselves. Like an animal. Anyways. Its mission is to inspire everyone about the beauty and complexity of the brain and to stimulate discussions at the intersection of art and science. Contestants from all over the world submit their breathtaking, gorgeous art to a jury of art and neuroscience specialists hoping to be selected as the year's winner. Here are some of the wonderful submissions from past competitions. I'd like to bring attention to this wonderful competition and drive up awareness. And since anyone in psychology is welcome to enter this contest, I'm happy to announce this year, this anyone in psychology did. We here at Past Psych Tonight commissioned a graphic designer, Bill Chesney of Brownlee Press, to create this gorgeous piece of art, stunning, titled Candy Girls, featuring Leonardo DiCaprio's arguably most memeable character, Calvin Candy, as he admires the prefrontal cortexes of some young female patients. But I'm sad to report it was disqualified for the rule because I quote, that if people are depicted, they should have given explicit consent to be part of the submission. <laughs> Unfortunately, we were unable to get Leo's blessing despite our repeated calls. So that is the bad news. The good news is we actually had a second entry. Specifically, this majestic piece created by Evie Barber, highlighting the multiple nightmarish images the butt-shaped ponds generates in my dreams, and some items referenced in this lecture. So if you zoom in, you will find a glorious artistic patchwork involving an overlord Michael Keaton 
Rats feeding, fleeing, fighting, and fourth effing. Me being forced to suck down an Arby's sandwich. An off-balance wobbly cat. Leonardo DiCaprio lamenting the fact that someone's turned 25. And finally, the most horrific image of all, a Ponderosa closing. Truly nightmare. Unfortunately, we fell victim to the same BS rule. And this beautiful piece of art was disqualified as well. So, you can imagine just how relieved we were to suddenly remember, hey, we'd actually entered one other art piece as well, which I'm happy to say did qualify for the competition. Here it is, the lone horse we have left in this race. Behold, this piece, a teenage hand turkey being really mean to his mom due to an underdeveloped prefrontal cortex, is designed to interrogate the omnipresent tension between the incandescent flames of emotional impulses and the gentle penumbra of sanguinity waiting to close in as the fires of our passion are baked in adulthood. Notice how the feathers, while phallic in nature, also coruscate gaily in direct juxtaposition with the bland burnt umber of the main body. This hand turkey, whose name is Randall, is a challenging monument to the complete incompleteness of being, the sublime confusion that characterizes all metamorphoses from childhood to adulthood. No one in their right mind would at least not put this through to the second round. So judges, it's over to you. If we don't win, the National Neuroscience Art Competition will have lost all of its integrity. That's our show. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, I hope we're back again soon. Good night, everybody. Hey, what's up, guys? Uh, I got everything set up. Michael Keaton Fest 2023, we're ready to go. It starts tonight, baby. Oh God, yeah, it's, it's gonna be it's gonna be really really great. I just want to let you guys know I got everything set up. I got the projector going. We got multiplicity ready to go. I'm really excited because I actually haven't had anyone attend. This Keaton Fest is gonna be amazing. So I figure you know if you show up around 7:30 that'll be good, and then we'll get the start. Oh, um, you can't make it. Something came up. Don't worry about it. It'll be it'll be okay. You don't need him. You don't need any of them. Come on. Get him, Kevin. I just need you and Michael. All you need is you. And you have this part of yourself. You don't need them. She thought I was you too. What? Hey. We're not perfect. Yeah, not perfect. One bad day. You tried though. We really did. It's a nightmare. You don't need them. We destroyed your life's like you did. You don't need them. <laughs> we tried that. We really did. It's a it, it won't. It won't really. Um. <laughs> We're not perfect. Yeah, not perfect. I'll be okay. Come on.